Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Take heart, you pilgrim, rejoice now and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Shout from the hilltops the joyful refrain, Jesus is coming again. Coming in glory, the Lamb that was slain, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. I will be inviting Pastor Douglas to join me here on the platform. I know you would want more time at your tables and uh, of course you'll continue tomorrow tomorrow as you come to the next seminar but uh, you met Pastor Douglas last night uh, we all enjoyed the topic that he shared with us it was very intriguing very yes. interesting we want to have all the answers tonight oh. will you give us all the answers is his mic on it's on can can we hear You hear him? Okay. There, there you go. So, will we get all the answers tonight? Yes, we will. Uh, we will kind of uh, journey our way through the Word of God, and uh, okay. slowly but surely, we'll get some of the answers. So, tonight. we'll get some, we'll right? Get some but more questions, probably, right? Yeah, more, the questions are good. <laughs> Hopefully, we get a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, so, you do that. Is that your first time doing the seminar? Or? No, no, no. Oh. This is not my first time doing a seminar like this. I usually do one every year at different places, different countries. And what, what countries have you presented your seminars at? Uh, I've lost track, to be honest. <laughs> but my, the last country that I did was Moldova. Okay. Uh, I know about Moldova. Yes, Moldova. They I have good you. food there. They have very good food. They have very good food, yes. Wonderful. I really enjoyed the food in Moldova. I enjoyed the uh, culture. Yes. And, uh, Mama Liga. Mama Liga's yeah. and uh, grape juice. <laughs> it was very nice. And the honey. Honey, Moldova their honey is the best honey in the world. Wow. Uh, so you traveled many countries. Yes. Where did you find the best people? In, in uh, the best people uh, in Ottawa. I gotta I be hope. correct right here in Ottawa, <laughs> Tennessee. Um, you're, ma you're married, right? Yes, I am married. I'm happily married to one wife. Oh, good. And uh, <laughs> so I just want to make that very clear. Is she supporting you in your ministry? Yes, she does. She, she supports me. What's her name? Her name is Meliana. Meliana. Uh, and so she's actually here right now. She is here. Yeah, she's on my right hand side. Let's give her a round. Meliana, could we have you stand Let's for her? Stand. Wonderful. And, uh, Good to have you here. Yes. She, she'll be preaching tonight? No, or? she'll be singing tonight. Singing. Yeah. So uh, she does the singing, I do the speaking. And Perfect. So we kind of keep to our own department. Does she sing for you at home? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it depends. I gotta keep her happy. Her happy. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Wonderful. And uh, I know Pastor Doug, uh, Douglas has good answers to uh, biblical questions, also spiritual questions. So you can use the cards, those white cards right on the table. And you can write your questions down and uh, leave them with the table leader. And then tomorrow, uh, you'll take a few minutes, yes. right, to answer Correct. some of those questions that we'll receive from everyone here. And um, sure, we're looking forward uh, to your presentation and, of course, thank to you. your wife singing. Yes. So thank you for thank coming you. to Ultawa here. Okay, well, now we have... Uh, yeah, we, we are here to see how God's prophecies and God's word is very real and very practical. And, uh, you know, I told you last night that my last name is Kulakov, which is, sounds to you, what language? Russian. And uh, 
I grew up reading my Bible in Russian language. You don't find any Russian Bibles on the table, but I know how my parents treasured the Word of God because it was um, illegal to keep Christian literature in your home, especially Bibles. So you may, you may end up in jail if they find any Christian literature. If you share a Bible with someone during those communist times, the times of atheism, you may end up in jail also. But uh, Christians were still eager and passionate to share the Word of God with someone else. And they would use typewriters, and they would type uh, God's Word, the Bibles, and just spiritual literature. And they were so excited. They were not afraid. That's the main thing. They were not afraid. Look at uh, Psalm 31, verse 20. Psalm 31, verse 20. It says, you hide them. I don't know the page in your Bible, but Psalm 31, verse 20. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. So God has a hiding place for us when we are with him. And then the psalmist says, you keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. So um, my father, he spent um, a number of years in prison because he was sharing God's word with someone else like here we have that freedom to open our Bibles we have a bunch of Bibles on the table but uh, when when he was young he was arrested by KGB officers and sent to prison spent five years in prison just because he was sharing God's Word with someone else but then after he was released and uh, he still believed that God will shelter him and will guide him and will bless him so he was sent to an internal eternal exile in Central Asia and while there he met a young lady who believed in uh, God and uh, was very excited about the Bible and they met one another on the third time they met each other they got married and uh, they lived happily 56 years until he passed 10 years from cancer. But um, I'll tell you that when they had two kids, they moved to Central Asia, and then they had two more kids, and then uh, he, was not, he was not allowed to be an official pastor at that time because you could not be a pastor. That was not according to the communist regime they would not allow that so he had to do that sort of unofficially underground secretly in Almaty city and Almaty is the capital of Kazakhstan how many of you know about Kazakhstan you know besides Borat you know something like good about Kazakhstan it's a beautiful country so he is there uh, having four kids his wife gets pregnant again and expecting the fifth child and when she was already a few months uh, into her pregnancy, the KGB officer comes and leaves an official note uh, with, actually, he left that note with my mom while my dad was away. And in that note, uh, there was an official notice that my dad had to leave town in 24 hours because of his mission work because of what he was doing, preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel, that he would be arrested. So they are, were, they are very disappointed with his mission work. Uh, and the church was thriving. The church was growing. So they had a few hours just to pack their suitcases and to get four of their kids and the fifths in the mother's womb and to go and run somewhere and that's one of the verses that my dad said they were reading and finding comfort Psalm 31 verse 20 you hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracy of man and so they run to Uzbekistan so when I hear I, I heard that story from my mom a few times and she's still living she lives in Ultawa actually She's 86, and so she would, and even though her memory is certainly 
very weak with dementia that she has, she still remembers many wonderful things of how God would hide them and, and shelter them under his wings and would keep them safe. And they ran away to Kokand, a city in Uzbekistan, not knowing anyone. There was no... There, there were no Christians there at that time, and so that was a place to hide from the persecution from the authorities. And uh, while being there, they, mm, his wife, uh, expecting the fifth child, could not even see a doctor because they did not have a house to live. And not having a house to live, they couldn't register her address. And without proper registration, you could not see a doctor. And she was very concerned. She was about to give birth. And so she met uh, her husband uh, in the city park that one day. And they sat together and cried and prayed and opened God's word again and read that verse that God will still give that hiding place. God has a shelter for them. Under his wings, everything will be fine. And a few days after that, that uh, lady was taken to the hospital and they gave, she gave birth to her fifth child, who they named Peter Kulakov. So that's how I came into this world from the parents who believed that God gives shelter to those who trust him. God is their pavilion. And under his wings, even being persecuted, even running away, even not having a place to live, they can still trust the Lord and the Lord will bless. And my mom believed in having lots of children because she was saying, that's how we will have more Christians in this world. And she always wanted to have more boys because she was saying, if you have sons, they will be pastors for the Lord. And so I was the third boy in the family. And by my mother's prayer, all three are pastors in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we know God blesses his missionaries. And if we trust him, He'll have that hiding place for us anywhere we go. So as you study these prophecies, I want you to know that's not something about the past and not something just about the future. It's about our daily life with the Lord. It's good to see you back here this evening. And I'm going to be using the Bible that you have uh, provided for you on your tables. I'm going to be using that same Bible so that way you could follow with me. Uh, as we study tonight's vital and important subject. But before we begin, let's bow heads for a word of prayer, shall we? Eternal loving Father, we thank you once again for this evening. We pray that your Holy Spirit will give us clarity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to get straight into it tonight because last night I just simply laid the foundation for tonight's subject. And so if you have your Bibles, I see that you have your Bibles, come with me to the last book of the Bible, can anybody guess what book that is? The book of Revelation. And if you have a Bible like mine that's on the, your table, it's page 1183 of the New Testament. So I want you to notice here, Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to pick up where we last left off. Now, I left you with the idea last night based on the Word of God that one of the things that are, is happening today uh, and that will continue to happen is that the Bible introduces this idea of a global unification. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming very soon. Do you believe that too? I believe that we are living in the end of times, and the closer we get to the second coming of Jesus, I believe that the clarity of God's Word needs to be more clear and concise. The closer we get to the second coming of Jesus, dearly beloved, I believe now is no time to be vague. We need to be definite in where we stand in terms, of, in terms of our relationship with God. And that's the reason why night after night we're going to be digging into the Word of God so that by the end of tonight's series and every night series, uh, there will be no uncertainty in the life of every person that's, that's here tonight but that we can walk away night after night 
with some sense of assurance and certainty on where we stand in our relationship to God's Word. Can you say amen? And so I want us to go back here to the book of Revelation chapter 13, and I want us to notice here verse 3. Remember, we found out last night that according to Bible prophecy, a beast represents a kingdom, a power, a political kingdom, according to the book of Daniel chapter 7. That's what the Bible says. Now I want you to notice what it says here in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 13. And it reads, concerning this beast and this beast, and I'm going to expose to you who this beast power is. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's vital that you come night after night because not every subject, I'm just laying the blocks and each block prepares the way for another block. Okay, and by the end of tonight's series, we have built a nice house. Can you say amen? And so that's the reason why it's vital that you come night after night because the one night that you miss could be the night that has the answers to the questions that's plaguing your minds. And so each subject night after night builds off the other. So last night, I just simply built the foundation. And I want to build on that foundation, on that premises that I built for you last night. And so last night, we found out that this beast power is a kingdom, a political kingdom. And uh, every Protestant commentary will tell you that this beast power is none other than the Antichrist power itself. And I'm going to expose to you who this Antichrist power is has been, is, and continues to be. Then notice what it says here in verse 3 of Revelation 13. It reads, And I saw one of his heads as it were, has been mortally wounded, and the deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed this beast power. Now I found out, we found out last night that the Bible says that the whole world will wonder marvel, pay homage, pay respect, and will be fascinated with this Antichrist power. You see, this phrase in and of itself carries the concept of a global unification. That's the reason why, if we skip a few chapters over to chapter 17, and meet me there in chapter 17 and verse 13, we see this global concept repeated again. Notice what it says here in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 13. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 13. Now verse 12 here is talking about the 10 kings, the 10 horns. That's the symbolic of the whole world. The whole world is divided into 10 kings or 10 kingdoms. Now verse 13 says this, these. Now who's the these referring to? Well, you see, verse 13 is predicated on verse 12, referring to the 10 kings, which is symbolic of the whole world. Now, the Bible says in verse, thir uh, verse 13, these, referring to the whole world, these 10 kingdoms, are of how many minds, friends? They are of one mind. These 10 kings, these 10 kingdoms, which make up the entirety of the world, they are of one mind. Now, in another translation, it simply says, they have one purpose. They have one motive. They have one goal. They only have one object. Even though they are ten different distinct kingdoms which make up the whole world, they only have one purpose in mind. And can you guess what that purpose is? Well, you keep reading and it tells you. See, the Bible doesn't leave us in darkness. The Bible says here, these ten kings, which symbolize the whole world, the ten kingdoms of the world, these are of one mind. They will give their power and authority to who? To the beast, that Antichrist power. So even though there are ten unique, distinctive kingdoms which make up the whole world, they have one mind, they have one purpose. And their goal and their objective in life is to give homage and wonder and marvel after this Antichrist power. That's what's going to happen. And you see, dearly beloved, these things are happening right before our very eyes. I'm going to show it to you. You come every night. I'm going to show you how these things are happening. Now, now, we may not see it in its fullest extent, but we see it happening in little increments. And we are in the precipice of time, dearly beloved, when we're going to see this thing blowing out. It's going, to, it's going to happen right before our very eyes. So we may not see this global unification in its fullest extent, but we do see it happening in little increments. 
And so the Bible says here that, that there will be a global unification. And the Bible says that the whole world will wonder after this Antichrist power. Now let's go over to chapter, back to chapter 13. Join me a few chapters back uh, to, chapter, to chapter 13. And I want to show you something here. Uh, chapter 13. And uh, I want to show you uh, what the Bible says here in verse 11. In verse 11. Well, let's go back to verse, verse 4. It says here, So they, who's the they referring to? The word they is referring to those that wonder after this Antichrist power. The Bible says, and they worshipped. What did they do? They worshipped. You see, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of time, the issue is going to be over worship. Now jump down to verse 11. And I want to introduce to you this new beast, this other beast. Bible says here in verse 11, Then I saw another beast. Now what does a beast symbolize in the Bible? A kingdom, a power, a government. Okay. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And I'm going to expose to you, ladies and gentlemen, who the second beast power is. Because you see, dearly beloved, the Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us, that, that the, the second beast and the first beast actually work hand in hand. They work together, hand in hand, side by side. As a matter of fact, you're going to notice that the second beast power is the, is, is the beast power that does the biddings of the first beast, the Antichrist. Now I'm leading somewhere, so just follow with me. I'm, I'm leading you somewhere. Then the Bible says in verse 12, And he, referring to the second beast, he exercised all of the authority of which beast? The first beast in his presence. And he causes the earth and those that dwell in it to worship whom, friends? This antichrist power. So this second beast power, it's going to cause the whole world. And do you think that this second beast power is going to ask you? Do you think that this second beast power is going to ask for your permission to worship the first beast? The Bible makes it very clear that this second beast power will compel, will force the whole world to worship the first beast. And when you compel and force someone to worship the first beast, where's your freedom? So you see, dearly beloved, we see these things happening right before our very eyes. And I'm going to show you. Now, we may not see it in its fullest extent, but we see it happening in little increments. Then the Bible says here, then the Bible says in verse 13, Revelation chapter 13, He performs great signs so that He even makes fire come down from heaven and on the earth and in the sight of men. And He what? He deceives. I found, we told, I told you last night that the, the, uh, the Satan, he, he uses three things. He uses deception. What else does he use? He uses force and He uses hatred to gather His people together. He performs great signs so that He even makes fire come down from heaven and he deceives those that dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. And I'm going to talk about that image. That image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Then verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. And the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? To be killed. You see, dear friends, this is serious business. In other words, this second beast power will use any means necessary, even a death decree, any means necessary to bring the whole world to worship the first beast, even if it means, even if it means passing a death decree. This is serious business, yes or no? It's absolutely serious business. Then the Bible says here, notice what it says. Uh, verse 16, he causes. Another word for that word causes, he compels. He's not going to ask your permission. This beast power, he's going to take it from you. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. You may be sitting there tonight, you're probably wondering, well, pastor, I'm a man of means. I'm a person of means. This is not going to happen to me. 
You know, the Bible says rich and poor. You may be sitting there and you may say, well, I'm a man of prestige. I'm a man of position. I'm a man that's respected in the church. I'm a man that has a title in society. The Bible says both small and great, rich and poor, he will cause the whole world to wonder after this beast power. Now notice what it says here, dearly beloved, that no man may what? That no man may buy or sell. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, what this simply implies is that between these two beast powers, they have power over the, oh, they have power over commerce. As a matter of fact, when you read the book of Daniel, when you read the book of Revelation chapter 17, the Bible makes it very clear that the, between these two beast powers, they, they have power over the merchants. They, have the, they, have, they own all the gold and the silver. And if you think that this is a bit too far-fetched, it really isn't far-fetched. Because we actually see it happening today. Now let me give you an example. Buying or selling. Now let me give you an example. You, you, know, you know what I'm about to say, and you, you would agree. Now, if we were to look out into the world today, and if a certain nation, if a certain kingdom decides to, decides to do something that doesn't align with the United Nations, or the policies and the priorities of the rest of the world, what do you think that United Nation does? Hmm? You see, if a certain country, you see, this, this is not far-fetched, neither buying nor selling. We see it happening today. You see, when a certain country decides to go off tangent and doesn't align with the policies and the priorities of the world, Guess what they do to that country? They place economic sanctions on that particular country. Do you know what that means? That means that that country cannot buy or sell with the rest of the world until they recant and come back in alignment with the whole world. So you see, dear friends, this is not, this is not pie in the sky stuff. This is real. And the day is coming, dearly beloved, the day is coming in that what we see on an international level, according to the Bible, will then be seen on an individual level. No man can buy or sell. So you see, dear friends, the question that we need to ask is that if the whole world wonders after the beast, the Bible actually talks of a special group of people who are successful in refusing to bow down to this image power. The Bible actually talks. You see, the majority of the world wonder after the beast power, but the Bible actually talks about a small group of people who refuse to, to wonder after this beast. And notice how the Bible describes this group of people. Now jump over just one chapter to chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And I want to show you something See, the question that begs to be asked is, you know, with all of this global unification and with, with all of this death decrees and, and, and wandering after this beast power and not being able to buy and sell, I mean, how can I, how can I be successful? How can I be successful in refusing to follow after the majority of the world? How? I remember one time I was presenting these same meetings, uh, same presentations as one particular place I lost count places I've been to preach. And uh, one guy came up to me and he said, Pastor, I know what I'm going to do. You know, when, when, when this beast power comes to try to enforce its mark of authority, I know what I'm going to do. And I says, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to run to the mountains. He says, I'm going to run to the mountains and I'm going to build me a bunker. That's it. He said, that's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to run into the mountains and I'm going to build me a bunker and I'm going to grow my own food. And he says, I'm going to grow so much food and I'm going to store up as much water as I can that will last me for all of eternity. And then he says, but more than that, I'm going to gather up all my guns and my ammunition. You, right? I've just given away. This guy's from the South. And he says, and he says I'm going to grow my own food and I'm going to build my own bunker and, and, and I'm going to gather all my guns and I'm going to gather all my ammunition. 
And when they come to try to enforce the mark of the beast, I'm just going to blast my way to freedom. <laughs> that's what he said. He said, I'm just going to blast my way to freedom. And that's that. But what is it that gives success to these group of people that refuse to follow after the beast's power? Notice what it says in verse 12. Notice what is their success? Re Revelation 14 and verse 12. The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those, now, those that, ref that refuse. You see, Revelation chapter 14, verses uh, 9 to verse 11, talks about those that receive the mark of the beast. Then verse 12, it contrasts those that receive the mark of the beast, that those that refuse to receive the mark of the beast in verse 12. And so the Bible says in verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Can you say amen? What is it that gives these people success in refusing to wonder after this beast's power? It's not so much the fact that they have their own faith. It's not so much the fact that they have guns and tanks and bunkers and that they grow their own food. The fact that makes, the fact that these people are successful in refusing to wonder after the beast is that their faith is riveted in Jesus. It's not riveted in the, in the, in the foods that they grow. It's not riveted on their bunker. It's not riveted in how much guns and tanks that they have. The fact that these people are successful in refusing to wonder after the beast is that their faith is riveted in Jesus Christ our Savior. You see, dearly beloved, that's the only thing that will save you. That's the, only, that's the only thing that will save you is the fact that you are saved through the grace and the power of Jesus. See, when that day comes when you cannot buy or sell, your faith will be tested in terms of who's going to provide for your needs. And if God can provide the children of Israel on the, on the, uh, during the wilderness, he's going to provide for his spiritual children. Can you say amen? So tonight's subject is a very, very important subject. You see, unless our relationship is not riveted in Jesus, we cannot be part of this final generation that will refuse to wander after this beast power. So how do you have a relationship with Jesus so that we can be part of this final generation? Come with me to the book of Luke chapter 14. What book did I say? So the New Testament. I want you to... Now, dear friends, tonight's subject is, is so important. It's so vital. I wish there were other ways I could, I could show you just to impress upon your mind the importance of tonight's subject. And because tonight's subject is so important, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present it in the most simplest and in the most practical way I can. Is that okay? I mean, that's how important it is. Revelation chapter 14, and notice what the Bible says here. How do we have, how do we have this relationship? Revelation 14, page 1010. Uh, sorry, Luke. Luke 1010. That's in the New Testament. Luke chapter 14. And uh, beginning with verse 25. Notice what the Bible says in Luke chapter 14 and uh, verse 25. And it reads here, and if you have a Bible like mine, which is on your table, it's actually written in red. And if it's written in red, who's speaking here? It's Jesus. Okay, these are the words of Jesus himself. And notice what it says here in verse 25 of Luke. Uh, it says, Now a great multitude went with him, and he turned and said to them, If any man comes to me and does not hate his father and his wife, and his mother and his wife and his children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. You notice here, dearly beloved, in order to have a relationship with Jesus, Jesus actually outlines the steps of those that have the faith of Jesus right here in Luke, Luke chapter 14. Now here the Bible says that Jesus is walking and there's a great multitude following after him. And he said such strange, strong, and startling words. He turns to the audience and he says, Now, now if you hate not your father and mother before, uh, more than you cannot, you cannot be my disciple. Now notice what Jesus says. His very first word that comes forth from his mouth. Verse 26. The verse, very first word that comes from his mouth is he says this. You see, if you want to be part of God's final generation that will refuse to wander after the beast, it begins right here. This is what Jesus, he says, if any man, he says, if anyone comes to me. Now, 
I want, you, I want you to follow with me. Suppose, suppose Jesus says here, when any man come after me. Do you think that will make a drastic change to the verse? Now here Jesus says, if any man. Now if here simply implies that there's options. There's a choice available, yes or no? Now suppose if Jesus doesn't begin with the word if, but yet he begins with the word when. Suppose Jesus says, you know what? When anyone come after me, do you think that will make a drastic change to the verse? Why? Because you see, when is different from if. When, when you, when you say the word when, it's, 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 it, it doesn't imply options. I mean, it implies there's no option. There's no choice. It's just a matter of time. So Jesus says here to the disciples, he says if. And by using the word if, it implies options. It implies choice. You see, dearly beloved, in order to be part of God's end time people, you must make a choice. You must choose for yourself. Are you with me, dear friends? See, you see, God is not going to force you. You must make a decision. You know the reason why you must make a decision? Because when all is said and done, when all is said and done, and, by, and God forbid that this happens, when all is said and done, and you don't make it into the kingdom of heaven, guess what? You have no one else to blame but yourself. Why? Because you chose. You see, salvation begins with a choice. And here Jesus says, if any man, you must choose to come after me. Now I want to make it very clear when I'm talking what I define as a choice. You see, when it comes to the subject of salvation, one must understand how the human mind works and how the human mind governs, is the governing power of a being, of a person. And so when, when, when we talk about choice, we're talking about a choice is simply this. It's, it's making a mental ascent in your mind that you're going to do something, and you act on that mental ascent. That's a choice. You're making a mental ascent, and you act on that mental ascent. The fact that, you, the fact that you're here today tells me you made a choice to be here tonight. You made a mental ascent that you're going to come to tonight's prophecy series. And guess what? You didn't just end there. You went a little bit further. You acted on that mental ascent. You walked out the door. You got in the car. You put that key in the ignition. You put your foot to the pedal. And you drove here. You acted on that mental ascent. Are you with me, dear friends? See, that's a choice. A choice is more than just making a mental ascent. You've got to act upon it. That's choice. And so the Bible tells us here that God's final generation, those that refuse to wander after the beast, they, they begin by coming to Jesus by simply making a choice. You've got to choose. Notice what the Bible says here. And let's continue reading in verse 28, 26. If anyone, what does Jesus say? If anyone comes where? Comes to me. Now let's pause right here. Now, it's very interesting that Jesus says here, if any man come to me. Now, now the implication of Jesus simply saying coming to me carries the implication that Jesus is stationary. Now, notice here, Jesus says, you come to me. Now, if I were to stand in the stage and I were to say, brother, you come to me. Who's stationary and who's moving? See, I'm stationary and the brother's moving. Can you say amen? In other words, when Jesus says, when Jesus throws out the invitation, when Jesus gives you his word, he says, no, you come to me. In other words, Jesus is not going to force you to come to him. You've got to make a choice to come to Jesus. And, and, and it's the power of Jesus that leads you to come to him just uh, uh, at that particular time. Can you say amen? So we are to make a choice. We are to come to Jesus. But the question that begs to be asked is, okay, the Bible says we are to make a choice. We are to make a mental ascent. And we are to act on that mental ascent and come to Jesus. But how are we to come to Jesus? Well, come with me to the book of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew uh, chapter 11. I want to show you something here in the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter. And I want to show you something uh, in Matthew chapter 11 and, uh, and verse 28. Here again, we see Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Uh, this is page 945 of the Table Bibles. Uh, 945, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Notice what Jesus says here. He says, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the Bible says here that, that we must make a choice to come to Jesus. We make a mental ascent, we act on it, and then we come to Jesus. But, but how are we to come to Jesus? Now, does the Bible say that come unto me all ye that is life are tucked away in perfect order and everything is nice and well and I will give you rest? Is that what the Bible says? What does the Bible say? He says, come unto, notice who Jesus is addressing. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor. Uh, and, and, and he says, I will give you rest. Who's Jesus, uh, uh, who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to those that don't have rest. He's talking to those that are burdened. In other words, the Bible says that those that come to Jesus must come to Jesus just as they are. Can you say amen? That's how we come to Jesus. You see, dearly beloved, there is no other way you can come to Jesus but just as you are. There is no biblical verse from Genesis to Revelation that tells you how you come to Jesus. But this one verse here says that the only way you can come to Jesus is just as you are. No other way. There's no other way you can come to Jesus but just as you are. Now you may be sitting and you may be wondering to yourself, well, pastor, you don't know who I am. You don't know the depths of wickedness that I've fallen into. You, you don't understand how much sin I've fallen into. Let me tell you this, dearly beloved, and that may be true. That may be true. You may, have, you may have committed some of the most hyenas sins, but let me tell you something. You know the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. I heard one preacher say, you know, for every one gallon of your sin, God has 50 gallons of grace. You see, there is no sin that God cannot forgive. You just got to come to Jesus just as you are. There is no other way you can come to Jesus but just as you are. So please listen to what I'm about to say next. Please, because this is so vital. You see, the moment you think, the moment you think that you must make things right before you come to Jesus, you will never come to Jesus. I'll say that one more time. The moment you think that you must Make your marriage right, make your family right, make your life right before you come to Jesus. The moment you think you got to do that, you will never come to Jesus. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to keep you away from Jesus. And so the Bible says here that there is only one way, only one way you can come to Jesus, and that's just as you are. That's the only way. That's the only biblical way. Then the Bible says, that when we come to Jesus, what does Jesus do for us? See, the Bible says that when we come to Jesus, the only way we can come to Jesus is just as we are, just as you are. When we come to Jesus, just as we are, what does he do? What does he give us? Well, I want you to, I want you to notice. Come with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. Acts, the fifth chapter. I want to show you something here in the book of Acts chapter 5. And uh, notice what it says here in verse 31 of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5 uh, and, uh, and verse 31. And uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 31 is page 1056. 1056. 1056 of the tables, on, uh, of the Bibles on your table. Uh, Acts chapter 5. And uh, I want you to notice here... Uh, Speaking of Jesus, speaking of Jesus, the Bible says here, verse 31 of Acts chapter 5, and it reads, Him hath God exalted to his right hand to be a prince. Who's that talking about? That's talking about Jesus. Him hath God exalted to be of the right hand to be a prince. And a savior to give what, friends? To give repentance to whom? To Israel and forgiveness of sins. So the Bible says here that when we make a decision to follow Jesus, we must come to Jesus. How? Just as we are. There is no other way you can come to Jesus but just as you are. And so the Bible says that when you come to Jesus just as you are, you see, God is in the business of giving you gifts. And then the Bible says that when you come to Jesus just as you are, He gives you a gift. What gift does He give you? The Bible says He gives you the gift of repentance. You see, repentance is simply a, a hatred for sin. You see, that's the reason why we've got to come to Jesus just as we are. Because in and of yourself, we don't have power to turn away from sin. That's a gift that's given to you. 
We don't have the power to hate sin. That's something that's bestowed upon you under the condition that you come to Jesus just as you are. In other words, the Bible simply teaches us that you, we have no, you have no power in you to save you. I have no power in me to save me. I come to Jesus just as I am. And he gives me the gift of repentance. He gives me a hatred for sin. For in and of my own self, I love to sin. I have, don't have that power to hate sin. It's a gift given by God. That's the reason why we must come to Jesus just as we are. And the Bible says that he gives us the gift of repentance. Can you say amen? But you see, dearly beloved, the Bible tells us that there are two kinds of repentances. And so when the Bible says that Jesus gives us the gift of repentance, and I want to be saved, I want to know which repentance saves us. If there's two kinds of repentances, there's one repentance that leads to damnation, and there's another repentance that leads to salvation. And I, I, want, the, I want the kind of repentance that leads to salvation. How about you? Now, now, now come with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and, and I want to show you a verse here. In the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 7. And notice what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians, chapter 7. And uh, verse 10. This is page 1,115 uh, of, the, of the Bible on your tables. 1,115. Notice what 2 Corinthians, chapter 7 says. And, uh, and verse 10. And it reads here. For godly sorrow, or repentance, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted but the sorrow of the world produces what friends it produces it so do you see two kinds of godly sorrow here do you see two kinds of repentances there are two now what's the difference the bible says one leads to salvation the other leads to death so how do i know which repentance leads to eternal salvation well, here I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. Now, in the King James Version, it says, not to be repented of. In the New International Version, it simply says, the kind of repentance that leads you to victory. In other words, dearly beloved, see, this is the difference between genuine repentance and worldly repentance. You see, genuine repentance does not lead you to repeat the same sin. Genuine repentance leads you away from sin into victory. That's the repentance that saves. Are you with me, dear friends? That was a weak amen, so let me come at you another way. Let, let me try to explain another way. In other words, what the Bible is simply saying here, look, if you repent from lying, but you keep lying, that ain't repentance. Because genuine repentance leads you away from sin, not to sin. If you repent from committing adultery, but yet you still commit adultery, that's not repentance. Because genuine repentance will lead you away from repeating that same sin. If you repent from gambling, and yet you still gamble, that's not repentance. That's why the King James Version says, repentance that doesn't need to be repented of. So when God gives you the gift of repentance, he transforms in you the gospel of Jesus so that you don't fall back into the same sin. That's the reason why the Bible says Jesus didn't come to save us in our sins. He came to save us from our sins. Can you say amen? So the Bible says that we are to make a choice. We must make a mental day, a, a, a sin to come to Jesus. And when we come to Jesus, we've got to come to Jesus just as we are. There is no other way we can come to Jesus but just as we are. And when we come to Jesus just as we are, the Bible says he gives us a gift. What gift does he give us? He gives us repentance, the kind of repentance that doesn't lead to be repented of. But notice what the Bible continues to say in the book of uh, 1 John. Come with me to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 1, and this is page 1,168. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. What else uh, do, does this group of people, those that have the faith of Jesus, what is it that makes them successful? It's the fact that their salvation is riveted in Jesus. They've made a choice. They come to Jesus just as they are. They don't run to the Antichrist power. They come to Jesus. 
Jesus bestows upon them the gift of repentance. And then in verse 9 here, it says, it verse says here, if we confess our sins, he is what, friends? He is faithful and just to what? You see, when we come to Jesus, genuine repentance is always linked to confession. Now, I had one person come up to me and they say, well, well, pastor, you know, uh, if God knows everything, and he does, yes or no, if God knows everything, and if God is everywhere, and he sees you in every part of your life, why do I need to confess if God knows everything? You heard that question before? I mean, why is there a need for confession if he saw me? If he knows that what I did was wrong? Well, you see, dearly beloved, the Bible teaches us that confession is not informing God. That's not confession. You see, God knows everything. He, was, he, saw, that, he, he saw what you did. See, confession is more than just informing God. Confession is admitting and taking responsibility for what you did. That's confession. In other words, you have no one else to blame but yourself. If you lied, you say, Lord, I'm a liar. And I'm, blaming, I'm not blaming my genes. I'm not blaming the way I grew up. I'm not blaming the way I was educated. I'm not blaming, I'm not blaming my society. I'm not blaming. At the end of the day, Lord, I lied and I'm a liar. And please forgive me. You see, confession is admitting and taking responsibility for what you did. Can you say amen? It's not informing God. And so the Bible tells us here that when we go through this process, when we go through this process, we can be part of that faithful, successful people who refuse to wander after this beast power. So what happens next? Let's say that you've come to Jesus just as you are. He gives you the gift of repentance, genuine repentance. You genuinely confess your sins. What happens next? How do I know that God has forgiven me? How do I know? Well, I'll tell you what God won't do. God will not send you an email and say, I'm God, I've heard your prayers. God is not going to send you a text message. God is not going to give you, God is not going to give you a phone call and says, look, I've heard your prayers. I've seen you repent. I've seen, no, that, that God won't do that. So how do I know? You see, that's where I want to, that's right. That's the reason I want to introduce another concept in this process of salvation. It's called faith faith how do i know by faith can you say amen that's how i know by faith faith in what faith in the word of god faith in the word of god in his promise. you see if you have been faithful in following the biblical steps of salvation it does not matter how you feel by faith in john chapter 15 and verse 3 by faith the bible says through the word ye have been made clean can you say amen? By the word, ye have been made clean. You see, that's how we know by faith. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we must remember that the Bible teaches us that our faith is not predicated on our emotions. Our faith is not predicated on, on how we feel. Our faith, the Bible teaches us, is founded on the word of God. See, we, now, now, whether we like it or not, we are emotional beings. That's just the way we are. But we cannot trust our emotions. We cannot trust. Our faith should not be founded on our emotions. Our faith should be founded on the Word of God. And when you have gone through these steps, these biblical steps of being saved, the Bible says, it does not matter how you feel, you have been forgiven. You may not feel it, but you're forgiven. Can you say amen? That's faith. And some of you may be wondering, some people have often said, well, I've got to see to believe. I've got to see to have faith. Now, you, they, dearly beloved, I, I, I often like to challenge that concept because that's really not true. You see, the Bible, you see, the Bible teaches us unto every man has been given a measure of faith. That's what the Bible says. And whether we realize it or not, dearly beloved, whether we realize it or not, we are all creatures of faith. And the reason why we are all creatures of faith, do you know the reason why we're all creatures of faith? Because we are all creatures of limitations. You do not know what the next minute holds. You do not even know what the next hour holds. We have our limitations as human beings. And because of our limitations, we actually practice faith. Whether we realize it or not. I mean, how do you know? How do you know you're going to make it home safely? How do you know? 
You see, we exercise faith every night. You, you're going to exercise faith when you go. How do you know you're not going to be hit by a car tonight? How do you know? You see, we don't even know what the next minute holds. But yet we move ahead because of faith. Can you say amen? So you see, dearly beloved, we are creatures of faith. And the reason why we are creatures of faith, because we are creatures of limitations. We don't know what the next minute holds, but yet we go about doing our everyday duty because by faith we know. I mean, how do you know? How many of you were here? Now, there may be some. How many of you, are, just by the raising, how many of you actually saw this building being built? So how do you know it's not going to crumble? I mean, if you, if you didn't see this building being built, how do you know it's not going to collapse? You see, you exercise. You see, the moment you walked in, you didn't walk in like, oh, I think this building's going to collapse. No, you walked in by faith, my friends. That's what you did. You sat on that seat by faith. Can you say amen? So we practice faith every day because we are creatures of limitations. See, the problem is, is we just, we need to redirect our faith from the seat to Jesus. That's what we need to do. We need the same faith we have in that seat, the same faith that we know we're going to make it home safely tonight. We need to channel that same faith into the Word of God. And if the God's Word says, ye have been forgiven, ye have been forgiven. What do you say? So now come with me as I come to a close here. Let's go back to the book of Luke, and I'm going to close off on this point. Luke chapter 14. Let's go back to Luke chapter 14. And uh, I want you to notice here, Luke chapter 14 and verse 27. Notice what it says here, Luke chapter 14 and verse 27. And it reads, And whosoever, now let's, let's, let's read verse 26. If anyone comes to me, now notice here, I just, I just established the premises. I said, you know, Jesus says, you must come to me. In other words, Jesus is stationary and the sinner is moving by his grace and his power. But does he end there? Notice, no, he doesn't end there. Notice what he says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, verse 27. Focus on verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me. Now, notice in the previous verse, he says, you come to me. Now he builds on that premises and he says, now that you've come to me, salvation doesn't end there. Now you've got to come after me. Now in the New, in the new International Version, it says you've got to follow me. You see, here we see the two parts of, of, the, of, of the concept of salvation. You see, one part of the gospel of salvation, you've got to come to Jesus. But coming to Jesus in and of itself is not enough. You've got to now come after Jesus. You've now got to follow Jesus. Are you with me, dear friends? Too many people come to Jesus and their Christian experience ends right there. But Jesus says, your Christian experience doesn't end by just coming to me. Now you've got to come after me. We hear so many preachers preaching today, one aspect of the gospel, the coming to Jesus. But Jesus, now that you've come to me, you've got to come after me. You've got to obey me. You've got to follow me. You see, we don't, like, we don't like the Jesus that says, come after me, but we love the Jesus that says, come to me. Hmm? Isn't that the truth? You see, we love the Jesus that forgives us and cleanses us from sin. We love the Jesus that gives us the gift of repentance. But how about the Jesus that says, now that you've come to me, now that I've cleansed your sin, now I'm going to tell you what to do. How about that Jesus? Same Jesus. How about the Jesus that says, now that you've come to me, now that I've cleansed you from sin and I've covered you with my righteousness, now this is the way I want you to live your life. How about that Jesus? Hmm? Same Jesus. You see, we pick and choose our Jesus, don't we? We have a smorgasbord. We love the Jesus that says, that says, you know, turn the other cheek. We love the Jesus that says, yes, forgive, you know, uh, forgive not 70 times. We love that Jesus. But how about the Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. How about that Jesus? So when we come to Jesus, now we've got to come after Jesus. 
We've got to follow Jesus. And notice what the Bible says when you, when you connect this verse to Revelation chapter 14. The Bible speaks of a group of people, 144,000. The Bible says that John sees them. Guess what they're doing? They're following Jesus. You see, dearly beloved, please listen to what I'm about to say next. Following Jesus is a work of a lifetime. As a matter of fact, following Jesus is a work of eternity. And if we don't learn how to follow Jesus here on planet Earth, what makes us think we can follow Jesus in the new heavenly kingdom? You've got to come to Jesus. But now if you want to be that successful group of people that does not follow the beast, but rather follow Jesus, it begins by coming to Jesus, coming to the foot of the cross, just as you are. That's where it begins. You've got to make a choice, my friend. You've got to make a mental ascent. And you've got to act on that mental ascent. And you've got to come to Jesus just as you are. That's the only way. I wish I could stand here and I tell you there's another way. But there is no other way you can come to Jesus but just as you are. And you come to the foot of the cross. You come to that old rugged cross. And you admit to Jesus, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a thief. I'm an adulterer. I'm a liar. I'm not going to blame my genes. I'm not going to blame the neighborhood I grew up in. I'm not going to blame the way I was educated. I'm not going to blame the way I was parented. I'm not going to blame any of it. At the end of the day, Lord Jesus, I chose to sin. Please forgive me of my sins. Is that your prayer tonight? To come to Jesus just as you are to the foot of the cross? He can give you that power. And then when you come to Jesus, he empowers you to follow after him. Same Jesus, same Jesus. Praise God, we can come to that rugged cross just as we are. Let's bow heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your saving power. We come to you this evening, tonight, just as we are. There is nothing that qualifies us to hear our prayers but our simple need of you. There's nothing that qualifies us for you to hear us but the fact that we are broken and sinful. And so we come to you just as we are, pleading that you'll give us that gift. And so Lord, we pray that you'll also empower us to follow you, the Lamb of God, and to be part of that successful people that will not follow the majority of the world, but will follow King Jesus and have the faith of Jesus. Dismiss us tonight and bring us safely back tomorrow night as our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a good night. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at 7 p.m.